I wanted to talk about 10 specific topics, themes, and takeaways from the conferences that I think would benefit the CEO squad and everyone listening, because there might be a gem in there that is actually the thing you need to solve or like level up your business. Welcome back to On The Horizon. This is Melrose Michaels. I am your host, and I'm here to share what's worked for me in building my adult creator business to try to make building yours just a little bit easier. Let's get into today's episode. Have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes at industry conferences that are shaping the future of adult content creation? From cutting edge technologies like AI to new ways creators are monetizing their work, These events are more than just networking. They're where the trends of tomorrow are actually born. In today's episode, we are diving into my recent experiences at several industry conferences, breaking down my most key takeaways and exploring how these insights can help you grow your business, create deeper connections, and stay ahead of the curve in our ever-changing industry. I'm also going to touch on some of my personal takeaways from these conferences as well as this idea that I took away from the conferences with me around the theme of self-sabotage. Now, because the topic of this space is going to be kind of about the industry events that uh, I recently attended, I want to summarize kind of the the 10 key or core themes that I'm going to touch on. So the conferences I just attended, if you've been following the Seducing Success vlog over on YouTube channel, Um, or any of our our tweets, or just, you know, my own personal socials. I just attended the XBiz Amsterdam conference over in the Netherlands. And then after that, I took a a little week vacation. And then I went to the TES, TES Prague conference over in the Czech Republic. So these conferences in September, there's usually a few back-to-back. So there'll be like Expos Amsterdam, there'll be uh, AW Summit, which is a traffic and affiliate conference, and then there'll be, you know, the TES or TES conference. These in September typically are all aligned, they're all back-to-back. This year, they were a little bit sporadic, so I only attended two of the three I normally would. But I want to kind of just first define the conferences I attend in September for creators listening. They are not all creator conferences, and I want to make that distinction pretty clear. But I want to also explain why I go, what value I get from them, and then I'll go into kind of the 10 topics I want to cover about the conferences themselves. So Expos Amsterdam, if you're familiar as a creator, maybe you're new, I'm not sure, but XBiz has three conferences a year and they are adult conferences. They are for adult creators and performers. They are for adult businesses. And um, they're essentially a place to attend, you know, panels or seminars, learn all the things that are new in the industry, talk about the challenges we're facing, kind of come together as an industry and and make, you know, steps forward or, or network and build relationships so that we're all kind of united in our little corner of the world, so to speak. So Expos in general happens three times a year. It is Expos LA in January, it is Expos Miami in May, and then it is Expos Amsterdam in September. So this was the September Amsterdam conference I just attended. Now the other conferences, AW Summits and TES conferences, these are traffic and affiliate conferences, but there's a lot of other industries that show up at these. So there will be a lot of adult industries. There'll be a lot of traffic companies in industry. There'll be a lot of dating um, that goes there, dating websites, dating traffic, and a lot of affiliates. So affiliates are just, you know, anyone on the internet that makes money off of driving clicks through a link, so to speak. And in companies like adult or in industries like adult, traffic is very important. So when you go to these traffic and affiliate conferences, you're going to meet a lot of affiliates who are selling traffic to you know various places. And my main interest is people selling traffic to adult. So that's why I attend the AW summits. That's why I attend the TES conferences. And both of them do have you know adult themes mixed in. You're going to see seminars on OnlyFans. You're going to see um, you know, panels talking about the best ways to capitalize on AI and adults. You're going to see all of those core and key themes when you're attending these seminars at the TESS and AW conferences as well. So just because they're geared towards traffic and affiliates 
doesn't mean that there's no value for creators to attend. And it's interesting, this is only the second year I have attended the traffic and affiliate conferences. And this year I saw way more creators attending them than last year. Um, there's still not a lot. I would say there's a handful of us, maybe, you know, five to seven creators that I noted anyway. But when I went last year, there was like three. So, and I was one of them. So anyway, I went to Expos Amsterdam. I went to TES Prague. Those were the conferences I just attended and got back from the EU from. And I wanted to talk about 10 specific topics um, and kind of like themes and takeaways from the conferences that I think would benefit, you know, to the CEO squad and everyone listening. So these topics are kind of conference takeaways and industry trends, you know, so insights, emerging technologies, uh, monetization trends, fan engagement, things like that. The power of networking as a whole, building relationships, support networks, things like that. Building partnerships and collaborations. So in that vein, I'm thinking about like how you identify partners, negotiate collaborations, brand partnerships, etc. Um, the fourth theme is leveraging knowledge from other industries. There are so many seminars and panels you can sit in on at these conferences that might not be directly related to adult, but can be applied in the adult industry. Then there is the fifth theme, which is kind of like the role of conferences in terms of professional development. The sixth theme is just challenges that are facing the adult industry. The seventh theme is kind of content creation and diversification strategies. The eighth theme is this idea of like self-balance um, and balancing your schedule and, and your energy during conferences. The ninth theme is kind of the future of adults. This will be a lot of, you know, AI conversations. And then the 10th theme is like elevating your brand just through having a conference presence. And beyond those 10 core themes, I do want to touch on just exciting things from the conferences that were great takeaways for me, for my companies. And then also this idea that was like just over my head as I came back from these conferences, which was this idea of self-sabotage. And I'm going to get into how that came up for me, why I'm thinking about this topic and, and why it matters uh, after our conference. So First, let's get into just kind of the conference takeaways and industry trends, right? So when you're at these conferences, you're going to hear a lot about industry trends. That's, you know, there's almost always a seminar or a workshop or a panel that talks about trends in the industry. I actually moderated a panel at Expos Amsterdam literally about industry trends. So you can almost always expect to sit on something regarding industry trends at a conference if you do attend one. So the emerging technologies that kind of stood out as far as what's trendy right now in adult is obviously AI. Um, you guys know we just put out our own AI product with GPTs and with that product and with so many things we're coming across now in adult, it is a almost inevitability that you will see more companies pushing digital twins, more companies trying to assist in content generation for adults, more of these agencies trying to use AI in terms of chat automation, and then more of these like CRM tools, similar to like Only Monster, Inflow, Super Creator, that are meant to incorporate technology and AI into how you can better streamline your work on OnlyFans specifically or other adult platforms too. So this was something that you're going to see a lot at these conferences. And this is what a lot of discussions were, you know, held around were these kinds of technologies. Another thing that was kind of a takeaway in industry trend as a topic was monetization trends. And we hear a lot about this in our own conversations within the community, within our little close community, CEO society. Creators are talking a lot about is the subscription model dead or is it dying is it coming to an end and if you've been in the industry you know a decade or more like i have you've seen a lot of monetization trends or you could label them business models come and go so when i got into adult 10 you know 13 years ago now the big thing was webcam i was a webcam streamer that was my main focus uh, i made majority of my income off of webcaming and then things started to trend, like trend differently. Then it became about clips and having a clip store. That's when many vids came into the picture and kind of came on the scene. And then everyone was suddenly selling clips because it became so much easier for creators to do it themselves. And then not long after that, you know, this is when cell phones really start, decided to steal attention and, and social media became really in your pocket on a cell phone. 
And then everyone's attention shifted and the trend shifted from desktop-based things to cell phone-based things. And this is when we saw the huge rise in premium Snapchat kind of hit the scene. And premium Snapchat's where I made most of my brand name as Melrose Michaels as well, you know, through Fancentro. If you followed me, Fancentro had the best premium Snapchat platform in order to monetize premium Snapchat subscriptions. That was the most obvious way I could get onto cell phones. And that's why I capitalized on that trend at the time. And then you saw the subscription trend trend away from a premium Snapchat model to a fan site model. And that's when, you know, OnlyFans came onto the scene. And now we have all of these different fan site platforms. Fan Central now does fan site. You know, we've got Fansly, we've got uh, Sex Panther that has a feed feature now. Like all of these things are trends. So a lot of the conversations inside CEO Society or just on Twitter with the CEO squad, I see people questioning if the monetization trend or the subscription business model is kind of coming to a halt. And the topics and what I've you know heard in passing at these conferences was that people are questioning this trend and if it is slowing down because the reality is with a lot of creators coming into the space after COVID, there's a lot of, you know, platforms with fan site accounts with subscriptions where creators launch it and then they don't keep up with it. That's just, it's bound to happen when when we have a huge flood of people to an industry, right? And because these fan sites aren't being maintained, there's a lower quality um, being achieved for fans. Like fans will come to a subscription platform like OnlyFans, they'll buy a subscription, they'll realize the creator's not updating at all, the fan gets disappointed, and then they rinse and repeat that same process until they're tired of the subscription model. Um, and then also just the era we're in, right? Like everyone has subscriptions right now. You have a subscription to Netflix, Hulu, HBO Max, Disney Plus, um, Apple TV. And when you have so many subscriptions, do you really want another subscription? So there seems to be this subscription fatigue that does seem to be trending in terms of different monetization trends uh, in the industry. And I did hear a lot of people talking about that when I was at the conferences as well. Then there was some talk of fan engagement trends. And this is just kind of like this era of the creator economy as a whole, where we're all trying to capitalize on fan audiences in unique ways. So some of the things that, you know, are ways that you can do this and the conversations that I heard being had were around gamification of this, about live streaming again, and then about just personalized and custom content. So unique ways to engage with fans that are kind of on top right now. And those were the three that kind of stood out. Um, some other trends that were spoken about were just shifts in consumer behavior. I think that mainly takes us back to the idea of the business models that are kind of seeming to stagnate being the subscription model. And then there was um, some talks about like Web3, you know, the NFT conversations have died down. I don't know if you've noticed this on your timeline. I've certainly noticed this. And personally, I wasn't super engaged in any conversations about Web3 or NFTs or blockchain stuff or crypto, just because for me, I'm not saying those conversations weren't had and probably were very much had at the conferences. I just didn't take part of them. My core focus is to master the internet as it is now, not the future internet. <laughs> so for me personally, I steer clear of those conversations because I only have so much bandwidth and attention span. If you're enjoying this podcast episode so far, please take one moment to share it with another one of your adult content creator friends, because you know what the rule is here. We do not gatekeep and we want to make as many adult creators businesses as easy as possible. And you sharing this episode with them might do exactly that. Thanks so much in advance. For the next topic, topic two, the power of networking, I really want to kind of just express how how I think this is the most important takeaway for me from conferences. I do attend the panels and the workshops and seminars, but I find that almost all of the value I derive from conferences is in the networking at them. And usually that happens, you know, around the bar at the evening events, like the little social mixers or at the um, night events, like the, the club events or the party events. And the reason for this is because I find if you build genuine relationships with industry, you know, people, whether they're colleagues, whether they're competitors, whether they're creators, whatever you define them as, there is no bad relationship. Like you never know 
who you're going to need to know in this business. And I think for that reason, and, and because of that reason, I've done a lot better than I would have otherwise, because I have great relationships with people that I've met at these conferences, people I followed up with, people that also I have no... I have no foreseeable future business with just people like, okay, you're really cool. I want you to be my friend. Let's keep in touch. I'm going to follow up, check in on you and, and whatnot. And sometimes that is the kind of dark horse from these conferences is that that person who might not have any perceived value business wise to you might know the person that has all the value to you. So for this reason, I really focus on networking. I focus on building genuine relationships at these conferences um, because knowing people in this industry, because it is actually a relatively small industry, even though it's, it's massive, it's also, you know, it's a small group of people pulling all the strings at the top of it. So who you know, I think, becomes very important in how easy it is or how frictionless it is for you to move around and, and build in this in this space. So especially as a creator coming in, making a bunch of friends, figuring out like who the face of each company is, how best to communicate with them, how to get in, in touch with them, and also just like shooting your shot when the time is appropriate. I you know, kind of shooted my shot with somebody at this conference specifically. And now I have something lined up um, that's very exciting, like a super exciting project. And it was kind of off the cuff and something I not, didn't necessarily plan on doing. Um, and it's it should, you know, greatly benefit my career. But we'll, we're going to turn a case study out of it. And I'll tell you more about that at the end. So just the power of networking in general. And I guess the way I go about this, like I said, I just hang out really around the bar when it's the mixer time or really at these night parties and events, go up, introduce yourself, be super friendly, buy people drinks, like just be generous in terms of what you can and um, get to know people. Like you're, it's not, it shouldn't be motivated from um, kind of like a point of business. It should be motivated from like genuinely figuring out who people are, um, what they care about and, and building relationships. So if you go in with that, kind of intention, I think you'll do really, really well. I want to tangent off here a little bit. The other byproducts of the networking thing is that you get a, a, a network of support as well. So you'll have like alliances with the industry, you'll have peers that you can relate to. Um, and on the best case scenario, you might get into kind of a mentorship uh, relationship, uh, which I have done from these conferences as well. And that's really, really beneficial. The other thing is like at these conferences, when you're networking, you can approach and you can have conversations with the most influential, you know, of the industry leaders. So having that ability to come into contact and rub shoulders with people that you probably couldn't get a meeting with or couldn't get a phone call with, that's a huge advantage to conferences like this. Um, and then there's cross industry networking. So the fact that you can network with people that are, are not related to adult is really cool. And you never know when those relationships are going to come in handy, whether that's a traffic a traffic person, an affiliate, whether that's, you know, someone in crypto, someone in the dating uh, side of things. You never know who you're going to need to know is kind of the, the gist of this. And then also because, you know, Amsterdam and XWiz was a creator conference, there's so many opportunities to pre-plan collaborations or to create content while you're there and then make your money back from actually attending the conference to begin with. And I think that's really important. And also when you're networking, you can set up collaborations for the future conferences, which again, huge benefit there. And this takes me into kind of the third theme, which is the building of partnerships and collaborations. When you are networking with these people, you can be identifying potential partners in business. You could be identifying potential traffic partners. You could be identifying um, just any kind of, even creator, like potential creator partners. So when you're there, you can keep these things top of mind. Like, okay, this was a really cool person I met. This is their name. This is what I remember talking to them about. Are they a potential partner to me? Are they a potential collaborator to me? Um, do they drive traffic that I could benefit from? Is there any value I could, you know, provide them? These are the kind of key things I keep in mind when I'm trying to build partnerships and collaborations. And then there's also a lot of opportunity for brand collaborations. A lot of the biggest brands in adults will be at these conferences. So if you're looking to, you know, work with a DMCA company or if you're looking to try to be a brand ambassador of some sort, you can approach those companies at these conferences and talk about those potential partnerships. 
Then, of course, there are so many, so, so many affiliate marketing uh, and influencer partnership opportunities, uh, especially the affiliate conferences. Not only are affiliates there offering with that whatever you know they're selling, whatever traffic and clicks, but you can also find and navigate ways to become an affiliate for these same companies as well. So that is always there and available to you at the conferences. Now, the fourth topic is just this leveraging of knowledge of other industries. Because at the traffic and affiliate summits, and there's so many other industries attending, you get to like sit in on seminars and panels that might be totally irrelevant to your creator business, totally irrelevant to the adult industry, but you can steal and take away so much good information, especially about things like marketing and branding. There was a lot of great seminars on marketing and branding. There was a lot of great seminars on customer retention, how to keep customers you know, in your ecosystem for longer and how to monetize them better, more effectively. Because that's something every business is trying to do. So that was really relevant. The other topic was automation and scaling. You know, everyone wants to automate as much of their business as they can. And in seeing how other companies are automating some of their processes, you can take that same strategy and try to use it for yourself in your adult creator business. There was a lot of talk about scaling. Um, scaling is very difficult to do as a creator just because there's one of you and you can only create so much content and you can only, you know, do so much in a 24 hour period, but it is possible to scale a creator brand. You just have to know how to navigate it. So hearing the challenges and triumphs from other businesses in other industries and how they've navigated scaling their brands kind of gives you some indication or some type of path forward on how you can start to conceptualize, you know, scaling your own creator business. And this is kind of what I mean when you're, you can take strategy from other, other industry and apply it to yours. Automation and scaling are two of the the biggest ones. And then there's also like cross industry case studies, seeing what things other industries have done, what tests they've ran, what their outcomes were, and then being able to see if any of that's relevant to you as a creator that is really useful. And there are a lot of workshops and seminars that you can pull that kind of information from. Now, the fifth topic I wanted to talk about is this role of conferences and what it plays into in terms of professional development. So obviously, the obvious one for me anyway, is continuous learning, like you're there at the conference to learn. There are panels, there are workshops, there are seminars, there's networking, you need to be involved and invested in as many as those seminars and workshops as possible because you're not going to know which of them is going to be the gem. And it's usually, at least in my experience, the one you least expect. So I'll pop into a seminar about AI because obviously we're developing GPTs and then I'll get a bunch of interesting stuff from there. But then I'll pop into a a panel about um, pay sites and how pay sites do things. And I'll get takeaways that that I didn't think were going to be useful that actually are extremely useful and extremely crucial to a problem I'm trying to solve in my own adult business. So I would say like when you're planning to attend these conferences, go over the schedule, definitely outline the, the key workshops or seminars you want to hit that are like highest priority to you, but then also take some chances on topics or workshops you don't think are going to be as interesting to you because there might be a gem in there that is actually the thing you need to solve or like level up your business. Now, aside from continuous learning, I already talked about accessing industry leaders, which plays a huge role in personal development. When you are in conversations with industry executives who have, you know, made millions of dollars and built just massive, massive empires, um, you get a level of exposure that will expand your mind, so to speak, like it will, it will expand your perception of the limits you set for yourself or the limits you set for your business. I love to attend lunches with industry leaders and execs uh, if I can, or if I'm invited, I love to, you know, buy them drinks at the bar, just try to offer something of value to be around them because you, you grow personal development wise from having proximity to people that have done incredible things. So the way that, you know, the access to these industry execs and industry leaders 
works in regard to professional development is massive because you just have that proximity to them. And then, of course, you have the opportunity, especially at like an Expos Amsterdam, to explore new platforms, which has a role in professional development because maybe the platform you're on right now, maybe you're on OnlyFans, for example, maybe that's not the right home for you. Like everyone likes to refer to OnlyFans because it's so trendy and it's so um, on brand and it's such a massive monster in the market. But like OnlyFans is not the right place for everyone. And and the fan site business model is not the right business model for everyone. And I like to bring that up because it's so easy to forget when you hear that brand name so often. So when you're at these conferences, you do get exposure to new platforms or platforms you might not be on yet. And sitting down to talk with the CEO of a platform and be like, what what is actually beneficial here to me? Like, what it, what makes you different? Why should I join your platform? And actually getting to have those conversations in a meaningful way can be really, really useful. Then last but not least, in terms of professional development, you can leverage conference materials. So like, you know, presentations you see, handouts you get, you can take that away from you or, or take that away with you when you go home and revisit it, follow it up later. And I think that's really useful for professional development as well. The sixth topic, and this is one we talk about from time to time. If you follow us, we just had a whole um, episode with Corey Silverstein, but um, challenges facing the adult industry. There are so many challenges that we're up against. And at these industry conferences, you really get to understand all of these challenges because the whole industry is there exploring them together and ways to unite and face the current challenges. So as far as like payment processor challenges, there's a ton of payment processors that attend Expos Amsterdam, that attend TES Prague. Um, There's payment processors there that are working on ways for creators to accept payments directly. So like imagine you want to sell a fan content and you want to take direct payment from the fan. And, and not do it necessarily on a platform like those things are be- being made possible, but you won't know about them if you're not at these conferences talking to these people. The censorship and deplatforming, that's a huge topic that comes up in seminars. You hear a lot of like workarounds, a lot of loopholes, a, way, a lot of ways creators are navigating censorship and deplatforming. The other part is like legal issues. Obviously, we know age verification is really big and top of mind right now. There was a lot of conversations around Um, how to navigate age verification, what to expect from age verification, how it's going to impact you as a creator directly, which is a topic we've talked about. And then also a lot of stuff around advocacy and activism. Uh, Free Speech Coalition goes to a lot of these expos conferences. It's a great touch point with them to, to understand what's really happening in our landscape, what you can personally do about it, how you can personally impact it for the better, and how you can do meaningful advocacy under the current climate of things. So at the conferences, definitely if you have the opportunity, check in or tap into some of the advocacy panels or workshops, or just like challenges, like like I said, the pay site processors usually put on really good um, seminars and workshops about the payment processing and, and how banking regulation is impacting everything. Um, and Free Speech Coalition usually does some really good ones around legislation. The seventh topic is that content creation and diversification strategies. So when you're at conferences, like I mentioned, there's platforms that are there and available. Talking to adult platforms at these conferences and asking them what strategies they see their platforms thriving the most with. Is it when the people sell clips on their platform? Is it when people have memberships to fan sites on their platform? Is it monetizing DMs on their platform? Asking CEOs of platforms how most of the creators on their platforms make money, like they're going to know that answer and be able to give it to you. And that gives you direction on what you should focus on on that platform. And that's really a key indicator of, of how to get an ROI out of your business. Also creating a content ecosystem. I mean, we talk about this. We talk about cascading content inside CEO Society. I just put um, a little video uh, tutorial on our YouTube channel about this. But how you can create content effectively and get the most out of it. I know that was a topic that was discussed at Expos Amsterdam that was really valuable. Also hearing about what creators are experimenting with. Like how they're utilizing TikTok to drive traffic. How they're utilizing Clapper or how they're utilizing Instagram. And all of the ways that are working and all of the ways that aren't, I think that is a massive takeaway from conferences because you get such an exposure to a sample size of creators all at once. You get so much proximity to your peers all at once that you can ask these questions and find out 
What is working? What isn't working? Is it subscription subscription platform still? Is it clip sites again? Is it live streaming again? You can kind of feel out where the industry trends are. You can ask your peers. You can get the answers that you're actually looking for. And I think that's part of conference planning too, is like when you're going to these conferences, you should not only like look at the schedule, list out all the things you want to hit and prioritize in terms of the workshops or the seminars, but you should also have like a list of questions regarding your business that you want to get answered. Like, what are you going to this conference for that you want to take away from it? Do you want to know if subscription platforms are still the best way to monetize your business? Do you want to know if TikTok is the best way to get traffic? Like, have your hit list of problems you're trying to solve at the ready as you go into these conferences so that you have a target. Like, you don't want to just (laughs) aimlessly network and aimlessly attend parties and events, which is honestly what I think most creators do when they do go because it's, I mean, it's fun and it's overwhelming and it's exciting, but having a schedule set, having a hit list of what you want to accomplish or take away from the conference is really important. The next part is just this little thing I wanted to include about self-care and like balance, which is such a crazy goal to have during a conference season, but almost everyone gets sick coming from conferences because you're just exposed to so many humans in such, you know, tight proximity, tight, tight closed rooms. Um, So making sure that you are taking breaks, like stepping away from the conference um, when you're feeling drained to like sneak into your hotel room, relax for a little bit, um, drink some freaking water, take some vitamins, making sure you have time for yourself, that you're managing your schedule in a way that's not crazy overwhelming. Like I try to set a maximum of how many workshops per day I will hit. I also make sure that I prioritize the hours I'm spending networking if I have a hit list of people I want to target during networking, like relationships I really want to build, people I want to get to know, I'll be mindful of that. And then also like, because we are creators, we have to somehow maintain our businesses while we're at conferences. So like making sure you're scheduled ahead of time so that your posts are going out, your DMs, your PPVs are going out so that you don't have to worry about that while you're at the conferences is really important. And then also just like making sure you're maintaining your safety boundaries. So like if you're at Expos Amsterdam, don't tag the restaurants you're eating at and check in. Like that's dangerous for fans in the area. So also making sure that you have those professional boundaries set and that you're not accidentally overstepping them and putting yourself in any risk. So did want to touch on some self-care and some balance because it's very easy to come home from a conference extremely sick and extremely burnt out and then extremely jet lagged on top of it. (laughs) Now, the future of the adult industry, this topic, I am sure you could guess that most of the conversations regarding this topic are around AI. There are a lot of companies developing digital twins. There's a lot of companies developing chat assistants or variations of that. And then obviously with Sexwork CEO, we have GPTs for like this inspiration assist and pretty much anything else you could want. I think a lot of the conversations around AI are really exciting. I think that they are typically geared towards benefiting the creator. I think most of the AI companies coming into the space are are pretty well-intentioned. I will say that as far as I'm aware, us here at Sexwork CEO are the only creator company that are like AI company that's come to, to the market. Like I haven't met any other AI companies at these conferences that are led by creators or have creators internally helping guide decisions, at least not yet. Um, so go us, I guess, on that aspect. But I think overall, a lot of the focus is on things like chat assist and um, generating content. And that comes with its own hurdles and that also comes with its own concerns. So I'd say in terms of the future of the adult industry and uh, AI, Keep your eye out for things that are going to benefit the creators more. I think that's most important. And then also just being aware of everything that comes to market. Like you can try these products, but unless they really align with you, I I would be hesitant because it has to really move the needle. Like any kind of AI or any kind of software or any kind of like tool or technology should really, it should benefit you in a meaningful way. And so if it's not doing that, I don't necessarily think it's worth it. And I think that's kind of why GPTs as a focus for us has been so important. It's like we want to build this tool that's going to be such a huge leverage on your business that it takes all the guesswork out of, you know, what content ideas to come up with. It takes all the guesswork out of what do I do in this video because you can script the whole thing. 
um, we want to take all the heavy lifting and inspiration out of the equation because it's impossible to be inspired all the time. And I think that's where, you know, hopefully you guys as well feel that we're really shining in terms of AI. Now, the 10th topic is just elevating your brand through conference presence. And I think where you can do this at these conferences is by asking to be on the panels. So for example, for XBiz, you can request, you know, to XBiz Lee or XBiz Mo, like, hey, I want to sit on panels. I would love to be a part of these topics. Um, I would like to be top of mind when you're creating these panels and be invited to these things. I only got put on panels because I started to ask. So I think creators often are afraid to do that or don't know that you can do that. You can absolutely ask to participate in future panels, workshops, seminars um, by asking the people that run these conferences, like figuring out who they are, forming those relationships with them, and then asking to be included. Also, just exposure. Like when you're at these conferences, you're exposed to other creators, you're exposed to industry execs, you're exposed to platforms and companies. So making sure that you maximize your exposure to them is really important. So if you are at a platform's party, like for example, at Expos Amsterdam, FunCentury had this huge party. It was super cool. I got to meet a lot of the EU FunCentury creators. And because I was at their, you know, closed event, invite only, you know, platform event was I think the day before Expos started. Like I was posting to Instagram, tagging FunCentury. I was posting to Twitter, tagging FunCentury, like tagging other FunCentury creators. Like there is no way that FunCentro isn't aware or that I'm not on there, not that I wouldn't be because ex-brand ambassador, right? But that they're not aware that I was at that event, that I was valuable to them for being at that event because I was posting to social, et cetera. So you can maximize your exposure because those brands that you participate with or that you tweet about or that you post about are going to repost you, which is good for you as a creator. But also your name is going to come to mind when they want to do cool things because you attended their events and you were valuable to them for having attended. So you can really leverage this as a creator to maximize future exposure opportunities or future traffic opportunities. So definitely consider that, like consider going to private invite only parties, consider tagging brands. Like I, I think a lot of people get caught up on like, I don't want to shout out a platform or company or service just because I wasn't paid for it, where really like when they repost you, there's a value there to you. And also there's a value to you that that brand, platform, company, product, whatever, thinks about you because their your name came up on their social once and they know that you're good for them and that they're good for you. So the exposure element I think is really fundamental and often overlooked. Then also there's the ability to build your brand through just your personal brand. So like you're at conferences, you can expose other people to you and your brand and the kind of content you do and, you know, the way you think about the industry, the way you navigate the industry, uh, ideas you have about the industry. Like just being a part of those conversations is all really meaningful and all really impactful for building your personal brand over time. And then also capturing content. Like obviously when you're at a, a, con a conference like Xbiz, you can do collaborations, you can make content not just adult content, but you can do vlogs, you can do interviews. Like there's a thousand, you know, creators at these things. So if you wanted to do street interviews with adult creators and like make a whole Instagram or TikTok series about it, you can do that in just attending one conference. Um, and then there's like behind the scenes footage, you know, all of this stuff, fans eat up. Like fans love that stuff. And when it's so difficult to make safer work content, for a safer work facing element to your adult brand, these conferences offer just limitless opportunity for that. Those are kind of the 10 core topics I wanted to talk about relative to the conferences specifically, but I do want to talk about just exciting takeaways, you know, I had for, for my businesses for the conference and also circle back to this idea of self-sabotage. For the exciting things that came from the conferences, I I got invited, and this is like, and I talked about this in our Seducing Success vlog, I believe last week, but I got invited to an all-female um, executives dinner. So this is like the top females in the adult industry. This is our executives that sit on the biggest boards in the industry for the biggest companies. And I don't know why they wanted me there, but I am so grateful to have been invited. This is actually the second one I got invited to. And this one was really meaningful. I can't go into like specifics of what was discussed because it is like a very private thing but I wanted to talk about just the honor of being included and the ability to have proximity to these 
especially female executives, as a female executive, you learn things just by being around people. You learn from the way they talk, from the experiences they share, from the challenges they faced. And when you get to be in rooms where those conversations are being had by those specific kinds of people, you evolve and grow as a person too. And I think that was really a huge takeaway for me is like, this is my second time being included in one of these. And it was very validating in the fact that, you know, these women see me as someone that deserves to sit at this table because of what we're doing here at Sexwork CEO, because of the product we're launching with GPTs, like, because we have this, you know, close community with CEO Society, they understand that what I'm doing is meaningful and impactful and that, that I deserve a seat at their table. And like, that was so validating for me, not just to think like, oh my gosh, we're on the right track with sex work CEO, like we're building something that people are noticing, but also like there's the other companies, right? So like GPTs is huge in terms of like our goals. Like we want to achieve really big things. We're a baby. We're not a huge company. We're a baby, but we're looking to do and build a tool that creators can't go a day without using. Like I want it to be that good. I want it to mean that much to everyone in the CEO squad. And I want it to be a creator to do it because I think that's really fucking important for the mission and for for the community, to be honest. So having conversations around GPTs was really cool with these execs. And then there's the, the other company, which I don't talk to you guys a lot about, but SWR Data is our other company. And it's basically the surveying that we do of you guys. So like you guys take these surveys and you give us this insight to the community at at a at a big macro level so that we can see like oh yeah we are being financially discriminated against here are the numbers and then we can take that to congress which we've done with the free speech coalition by the way or we can use this insight to understand like oh creators are most successful doing these kinds of things on these specific platforms so and all of this this report from swr data comes out in the fall guys so it'll be out soon for you to have all the the recent the recent data points and results but swr data as a company is interesting to other executives because no no one else can present them with an idea of what creators really want and need except for for us because you guys trust me with that information and also because you guys are willing to share it i'm hoping because you believe that we can make the industry better with it because that's, I mean, that's my belief is that if we understand fully at scale what creators actually want, need, or are up against, I can turn around and have those conversations with the biggest companies in adult so that they can align with us on giving us what we need, helping us face the things we're up against, and building things that really support us. So being at the table with these execs, especially all females, and knowing that they see the visions that I see and what we're trying to build and that they want to support me and what we're trying to do, like, that was just a massive, massive moment for me in this conference anyway. Um, and then the other thing that came out of this was, like, I had the opportunity, two creator opportunities arise, arose, and I can't speak to them in detail, detail, but um, they're essentially shoots that I could potentially do that I think will really change the course of my Melrose Michaels brand if they come to fruition like everything I don't want to speak too heavily on them because like you know there's I haven't signed anything yet there's no actual contracts in place so you know everything could still fall apart in theory but if those things came to fruition I think it could really impact um, my Melrose Michaels brand and grow it significantly at least from having done these shoots so if those come to pass I think that could be really cool and I'm really excited and looking forward to those. But because of that development, because these shoots are on the horizon, I came back from the conferences with this overwhelming sense of I need to be, you know, super disciplined because if I'm going to do those shoots, for example, I want to be in the best shape, you know, for those shoots. I want to feel as good as I can about myself. I want all of my businesses to be these well-oiled machines so I don't have to think about them and I'm just, you know, doing my tasks, checking them off and focus on the shoots that are coming. And then it got me and brought me just to this idea around self-sabotage because a lot of people, at least, you know, friends of mine 
internal colleagues and, and friend, well, I mean, everyone I work with is my friend, but internal colleagues and friends at Sextric CEO and, and in all my other companies, they, they will tell me often, like, I'm so disciplined and I don't feel that way. I, I show up for a lot of things. Sure. I make a lot of stuff. Yeah. I get a lot of things done, but like, I'm no perfect person. And I don't, I, I don't want it to ever come off that way because it's just not the reality of the situation. I have Netflix in burnout days. Like I, I cry, <laughs> like I'm a human. Um, nothing is perfect all the time. Um, despite how ever it might look on the outside or on social. So I got into this, you know, thought, I don't know, thought exercise, I guess, about self-sabotage because I feel like there are times where I won't show up for myself, where I won't stick with my commitments, where I will put off tasks to the last minute, you know, very human experiences, right? But all of those things are acts, in my eyes, um, of self-sabotage. And there's a different element of like, you need to also have self-care. And I agree with that. And I abide by that. But I, I'm just talking about this specific thing, being self-sabotage. And I was wondering, like, why we do this to ourselves? And, like, why would anyone effectively engage in any sort of self-sabotage when it is taking us further from our goals? And it came down to some realizations, right? So these are the causes, I think, of self-sabotage being the fear of failure or success. So, you know, success and failure can both be super intimidating. There's just this idea of it. And sometimes you fear the responsibilities or expectations or the potential changes that can come with success or just the fear of failing and like looking incompetent or stupid, which holds us back because we don't, you know, we want to avoid those outcomes. I think for me, one of the biggest reasons I self-sabotage is this, it's this fear of failure as well as this fear of success because of the responsibilities and the expectations and the changes. So I'm going to go deepest into this one because this is the one I, I really resonate with. With everything I want to do, there are more and more responsibilities and expectation. So like when I launched the Seducing Success vlog over on Sexwork CEO, I did that because I wanted people to see things that I do in my daily life, the, the re reality of what I'm juggling, um, what it really looks like inside all of these businesses. Um, also, I feel like a need to include all of you guys here at CEO Squad in, in the vision and in the, the documenting of what is happening because you're a part of it. Like, this is also yours. This I really believe that Sex Work CEO is yours. It's the community's. It's not mine. So giving you guys the ability to look inside through these, like, vlogs felt really important. Not that, not that they're particularly good. I'm still learning. But the point is, like, I wanted to document it so that you guys were a part of it because it is yours. But because I wanted to start that project, that came with responsibilities in the doing of that project and the expectation of having a vlog every single week, which is another thing on top of all the things that we're doing. And I think that like every project I take on comes with this new set of responsibilities, this new set of expectations. And that is like the biggest challenge for me in terms of self-sabotage because a new challenge and a new expectation is a new place I can fail or fall short. And I think for most people, that might be the biggest thing of why we fear success is because of those responsibilities and expectations with each level. And then also the changes that come with it, like you typically won't have the same people you start with if you're really going to be wildly successful at something because you outgrow people and you become unrelatable to people because you're doing an extraordinary thing and therefore you have to become an extraordinary person like by definition so people tend to fall off and it's like it's not like oh you know you drop your day ones because you're cooler than them like it's nothing to do with that it's just like I can't have the same conversations with the people I went to high school with because they don't understand business or they don't understand adult business or they don't understand being a creator or they don't understand what responsibility comes with having actual influence amongst a community. Like it's just hard to relate at certain levels with the people you start with at times. And a big fear of success is like, I also don't want to lose those relationships with people I care about. And you do tend to outgrow people at each level. So I think for me, it breaks into those categories of like why I self-sabotage. It's that fear of success in terms of, again, responsibilities, expectations, and then the changes that come with success and the relationships that change. 
But there are other things, and, and these don't resonate as much with me, I would say. Well, some of them, not all of them. But there's also, like, low self-esteem. A lot of people just don't think they deserve or are worthy of success or happiness. There's this meme that I saw that I shared with a bunch of my friends because I really believe it. And it says, uh, are you deserving of it? Are you worthy of it? Do you want it? You have to keep in mind, there's a lot of bad people who are insanely successful. There are a lot of bad people who are not worthy of it, do not deserve it, but they wanted it enough to have it, to go do the things required to get it. So for me, like, do I want to be worthy and deserving of success? Yeah, I want to be a good fucking person. I think we all do. But at the end of the day, it's not going to come down to that. It's going to come down to if you want it and if you're willing to do the work required to get it. So when I think about, like, is self-esteem for me personally a, a struggle point with why self-sabotage? Not as much. It used to be, I would say. Not as much every, anymore because I I think I can remove my feelings from that equation. Like, it, it comes down to the behaviors you do that align with the outcome you want. But for a lot of people, they really just don't believe that they deserve success or happiness or they don't believe they're worthy of it. And that self-limiting belief holds them back and sabotages anything that they want goal-wise. So, if that is something that resonates with you, maybe consider like, even if you don't feel that you are deserving or worthy of, of the goals or the outcomes you want, like you can do it being undeserving. Like you can do it being unworthy. You just have to go do it. So maybe that's helpful. I don't know, but I know that that is one huge element of why people self-sabotage. The other part is this idea of like your comfort zone and just the fear of change. Because change, even positive change, can be super scary. So people might self-sabotage themselves in order to just stay in their comfort zone because it avoids uncertainty and discomfort that comes with the act of trying something new or stepping into a new role. And that's super valid. Like, everything's uncomfortable outside your comfort zone. But I think there's real value in seeking discomfort because it is an element to how quickly you can grow and evolve. Um, there's that saying, you know, nothing... Nothing great ever happens inside your comfort zone, and I, I definitely believe that that's true. This other element is perfectionism. This is the other one that really resonates with me, because perfectionists often set unrealistically high standards for themselves, and then when you can't meet those standards, you might just give up entirely or procrastinate to avoid facing, you know, your own perceived inadequacies. I find that my perfectionism, one, puts out unrealistic products which don't sell. So, like in terms of content. My content is really well edited, really polished. It's really beautiful because it's what I want to put out in the world, which is okay and that's fine. It's just not going to be what sells as well because no one's going to relate to a perfect person. And I'm not a perfect person. So my perfectionism, perfectionism, perfectionistism really shows itself in terms of my content, but then also in terms of procrastination because I have this habit of like, if I can't do it perfect, I just don't do it which is so ridiculous because you have to be bad at things when you start them. Like you're new. You have to start bad. Like we all start bad and we, none of us want to look silly when we start something new, but it's part of the process and you have to. So I think that's another indicator. And then the other couple is just like emotional triggers, you know, past unsolved trauma can really play a factor into this. Also the need for control, self-sabotage can be a really a, a way for people to maintain a sense of control because you're, you're in control of the failure of it. You're in control of the outcome that way, especially if it's a negative outcome, rather than facing an unpredictable situation. So that need for control can play into self-sabotage and then just avoidance of vulnerability. Success and growth require vulnerability, which is something I have often also struggled with. So like you have to be open to feedback. You have to be open to rejection. You have to be open to facing the possibility of failure. So all of these things are going to make you feel super exposed and super vulnerable. And all of these things are, you know, kind of circling around my head, coming back from these conferences because I have all of these new opportunities from the conferences that I don't want to fail at. And then I find myself coming up with reasons to potentially self-sabotage. So I had to really work through that idea um, after coming home of like, why do I think I'm going to suck at this? Why do I think I'm going to fail at this? Why don't I just put my ducks in a row so that I can only succeed at this, no matter how long or how hard it is? So I just wanted to touch on that because I came back with this like lingering thought and I thought it was interesting that I could have such a high with these conferences and come back with all these great opportunities and all this wonderful insight about our industry. But then immediately your brain finds ways to 
ensure you don't utilize it almost. So I wanted to share that. I wanted to kind of put all of this out there in one episode, even though the themes are a little unrelated, just because I think it'll resonate. So if you're listening and it does, I'm super grateful. If you didn't get value out of this, I'm sorry. This is just my experience and kind of what my takeaways were, but I will start to wrap up this space. I know we're at the hour. It ran a little long. So I love everyone who is here and who's listening. If you haven't already, make sure you check out our latest vlog. We've been putting a bunch of effort into these uh, seducing success vlogs. And the latest one, I share my thoughts about self-discipline and the fear of success. So if that you know theme resonated with you, there's more over in the vlog about that. Also, we have Sex Work CEO exclusive content live. So we have some tutorials that have gone up on our YouTube channel. If you haven't checked those out, go check out those courses. In addition to the vlog, we have this recent course um, and we have GPT's tutorials as well. So we have GPT's has a separate YouTube channel. You can check that out. You're gonna find how to perf the crafted welcome message tutorial for OnlyFans over there. And this is kind of like a step-by-step -step guide for how you can use GPT's to create a welcome message that not only engages your fans, but also converts your audience effortlessly. So you can check out that. We just pinned the tweet for it at the top of this face. And then make sure while you're there to also subscribe to the GPT's YouTube channel so that you never miss a new course or tutorial about GPT's specifically. And then in case you've been living under a rock somewhere, I will just shamelessly plug, we did release this uh, product called gpts.ai. That's what I'm referring to with those tutorials. It is an uncensored NSFW AI chat tool where you can have, you know, endless inspiration as an adult creator. So whether you need content ideas for OnlyFans or help captioning a PPV for a clip or help crafting a viral tweet or help replying to a fan in DMs, whatever your need is as an adult creator, GPTs can help you do it. So it is completely free. You you literally can use the product every day for forever for free if you choose. Um, but if you do upgrade to the pro version after your trial, you can personalize GPTs with your own style and writing samples. So it will become truly an extension of you as a creator and it will help you in all of the things and aspects of your adult creator business that you could possibly imagine. So if you want to head over to gpts.ai, that's G-P-T-E-A-S-E dot A-I, or click the pin tweet at the top of the space. And again, make sure to tweet at GPT's AI with all of your feedback about the product so we can keep making it better for you. Now, um, if you haven't already, I do want to also plug CEO Society. Like we are over 600 members deep in CEO Society now. There's also tons of you know resources, information, anything you could need as an adult creator is probably answered in a CEO Society post. We have thousands of posts over there now. It's a very active community. Um, and there's also a whole section dedicated to GPTs, how to prompt GPTs better, how to get the most out of GPTs, advice, updates, all the things. So CEO Society is a great centralized place where you can find all the things you need for your adult creator business. Now, lastly, and most importantly, I do want to emphasize that all of the information we put out here on Sexwork CEO, we do so for free because we believe in this idea that the more financially successful creators are, the more resources we will have as a community to do things like lobby Congress, impact policy, organize, and more. So if you found value in the content you heard here today or the tweets you've engaged with, etc., please, please, please consider sharing it to your own timelines to make this journey easier for your own adult creator friends. Our only ask here is that you retweet our stuff so that we can help as many creators as humanly possible. So thank you in advance for that. Now that's going to bring us to the end of today's space. Huge thank you to everyone who joined. Remember, we turn all of these into written blog posts over on sexworkco.com. So you never have to take any notes. You can just revisit that blog post in a week or so. For our next Twitter space, it is going to be about what I'm currently testing in my own adult business. So you're going to hear all about my current case study that is upcoming and um, how I'm going to navigate it, what the plan is, and then we'll do a future episode on what the outcome of this case study has been. So thank you all again for joining me, CEO Squad, and I will see you all a week from now. Thanks, guys. It would be absolutely incredible. If you rated this podcast five stars and left a little review, we want to get this podcast to as many adult creators as possible. And you taking a second to leave a couple stars in a review really helps us do that. Thanks so much.